Tonight on Insights on PBS Hawaii. What is the expected impact on Hawaii over the ongoing budget negotiations on Capitol Hill on the federal fiscal cliff? What state programs could be affected? And how are state lawmakers addressing government spending and promoting revenue growth? Now, live in our studio, our host, Dan Boylan. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Boylan. On January 1st, Capitol Hill lawmakers passed the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. It eliminated the revenue side of our noisy debate over the fiscal cliff by raising tax rates on people making more than $400,000 per year. Congress also voted today, today, to extend the deadline to deal with the federal government's $16 trillion debt limit until August of this year. Meanwhile, if a deal is not reached by March 1st, across the, uh, across the board spending cuts, known as sequestrations, will come into effect. These cuts will be for, more, for an estimated $110 billion, divided evenly between defense spending and domestic programs, including Medicare. Then there is the March 27th showdown, when the legislation that has been temporarily financing federal agencies expires. A government shutdown would occur unless Congress adopts a new bill by that date. Are you confused? You should be. Deadlines come in Washington and deadlines go, but nothing much ever seems to happen. So how will all of this impact our own state programs that depend on these federal funds? What plans are in place to promote sources of revenue for our islands under the worst case scenario? And how will these measures help boost an island economy that, despite a rebounding tourist industry, remains sluggish? You can join our discussion by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments for our panelists. The contact information you now see on your screen will be repeated throughout the program. We also want to remind you that Insights is live on both your television and computer screens. It's streaming on our website right now at pbshawaii.org. This program will also be posted online. Now to our panel. Colleen Hanabusa has represented the 1st Congressional District since 2010. She is currently serving her second term in office. Before going to Washington, she was president of the state senate, indeed the first pre uh, female president of the state senate, and a longtime state lawmaker. She currently serves on the Armed Services and Natural Resources Committees of the House of Representatives. State Senator Sam Sloan has represented the district running from Diamond Head to Hawaii Kai for the past 17 years. He is the Senate Minority Leader and Minority Floor Leader, and the only Republican in the state Senate. He is president of the nonprofit Smart Business Hawaii, which advocates for the state's business community, and he owns an economic consulting firm. Calbert Young has served as the director of the State Department of Budget and Finance since 2010. Prior to his appointment, he served as the director of the Department of Finance for Maui County. His employment history also includes work for Kapalua Land Company and, the, and Kamehameha Schools. Carl Bonham is a professor of economics and executive director of the University of Hawaii's economic research organization, UHERO. Uh, UHERO. Uh, UHERO. Uh, UHERO provides analysis and develops quarterly economic forecasts for the state. Carl is also a member of the State Council on Revenues, responsible for predicting state tax revenues in order to help policymakers develop budget and spending plans. Your kids can call you hero, the man, the you hero man. My dad was the you hero man. Okay, this fiscal cliff, was this something that is just, uh, was just a media thing? Uh, it, there's a fiscal cliff. Everything that was on it, it seems, uh, has been pushed away. It was supposed to be tax, uh, tax raises for everybody, just tax raises for rich people. There were supposed to be cuts uh, in spending. There's been no cuts in spending that I can, that I can see. Uh, the, the ceilings on the, on the debt, that goes. What? Do you guys do nothing but play chicken and push deadlines away? Can't do that in journalism, you know. You've got to meet your deadlines. You guys don't have to do that. No, you're wrong. First of all, I think the most difficult thing is for people to understand what the fiscal cliff was. Banaki coined it. And it isn't one bill or it isn't a series of bills. It's the fact that a whole bunch of things were going to expire at a certain time. That's why I called it the perfect storm, not the fiscal cliff. And if it did, it would have really sent us off the, quote, the edge. 
But it wasn't all of that. One of the major issues that happened in the fiscal cliff legislation was the fact that we did receive on the Republican side concurrence that revenue was for the first time on the table. Remember, revenues was never part of the, right. the, the examples that they would give. We had revenues, which is going to result in about $640 billion over the 10-year period. In addition to that, what we averted, and that's really what the fiscal cliff legislation did, we averted a lot of other things. One was that was important to the small business people that were contacting me was the whole issue of the state tax and the fact that they maintain it. And that was five billion, five million each person. And, and in addition to that, if you went over 10 as a couple, then you'd get taxed at the 40% 40, uh, 40 rate. There was that. There was also the idea of of the unemployment extension, which we needed to have, or we will be heading into something else at that point in time. And there was a bunch of tax credits for small business in addition to that. For doctors, it was the SGR, which is, if, when that happens, you'll see all the people on Medicare afraid that their doctors will not service them because they're gonna get cut. That's a crazy piece of legislation that every year we extend. The alternative minimum tax was put to bed once and for all. And that would have resulted with a huge amount of ramification. And there was a whole bunch of other state tax. But it was also loaded with a lot of silly stuff. Uh, like uh, what? Tax breaks for NAS NASCAR racetracks. And, and, uh, and I'm, I don't mean to attack NASCAR. The, the, there were, you just did. Uh, there was a lot of yeah. good yeah. liberal stuff that got. <laughs> the, the, the what liberal stuff they got? It. I haven't got it right up. My, you guys have so darn many <laughs> things. No, 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 no. Seriously. I mean, there were, there were tax credits that were continued from the ARRA which people felt was necessary to keep the economy going. But what we didn't do, that you're absolutely correct about, is we didn't take care of sequestration. We didn't, but we punted that for two months. We did not take care of the debt ceiling, which is now, now we've kind of done it for until May 19th. But those things were not taken care of. However, those were the major things that were not taken care of in the fiscal cliff discussion. You're right about another thing, which is the fact that they said we didn't have, quote, cuts in there. But no. that, wasn't, that wasn't part of the, the plan at that point in time. The idea was how what would it take to avert the fiscal cliff? And what it took to avert the fiscal cliff was the fact that they agreed, Republicans agreed for the first time to revenue and the fact that the Bush tax cuts would expire for those who were $450,000 a year adjusted gross income for those uh, who are a couple and $400,000 for a single person. So, oh. so the reason that this was called the fiscal cliff was because essentially you were going to raise a tremendous amount of revenue. Those tax rates were, all the Bush tax cuts were, were going away, right? The extended unemployment benefits were going away. So there were all these things that were going to take money out of the economy. And then simultaneously, if the sequestration had happened, if it had gone forward and hadn't been kicked down the road, we would have had you know, $110 billion mm -hmm. in spending cuts this year. All that together would have thrown the economy back into recession. That's the, the cliff concept. <coughs> the resolution on the revenue side was very positive in the sense that it wasn't as nearly as bad as it could have been. Right? If you'd let all these tax cuts go away entirely, it would have hurt the economy much worse than what we got. So the, 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 the thing that needed to happen was to back away from this tremendous fiscal cutting, whether it's from raising taxes or cutting spending, that would derail this nascent recovery that we've got going. Sam, uh, now for the rest of the story. You know, uh, you had asked the question, was the, the fiscal cliff media driven? And to a certain extent it was. And people threw the terms around without really going into, into detail. Uh, as my two colleagues mentioned here, there were actually several components. One was the tax component, uh, one was spending and sequestration, and the third was debt. Um, interestingly enough, while uh, this was going on, the presidential election was going on. Right. Mm -hmm. And that really was the driver. And what happened was the American people tuned out. They didn't know about and they didn't care about fiscal cliff. They heard about Greece every day. They heard about California slipping into the ocean. And they weren't really getting involved or, or they felt that they didn't have anything that they could, they could say. Plus, years ago, my favorite economist, Sylvia Porter, said 
we're a nation of economic illiterates. And it's true. We spend more time on YouTube and with our dogs and cats than we do on, on these things. But the interesting thing is, my Democrat colleague, and by the way, Bill O'Reilly sends his best to you, Colleen. Um, he should, considering he loves Hawaii. Yeah, he, he does. Know it, he does. Uh, uh, while sniping. everybody says... Sniping, say sniping. Well, that's what we do, <laughs> in a nice way, in a civil way. Um, while everybody said, well... President Obama stared down the Republicans, and particularly those wascally House Republicans and Mr. Boehner, and they blinked. Well, here's the facts of the matter. The tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts that you both mentioned, 99% of them are now permanent. That was a big victory for Republicans, taxpayers, and, and the Tea Party. Um, sequestration, interesting. The Democrats tried to make the Republicans come forward and say, we're not going to let you cut a dime of defense spending. But guess what? What a surprise. Many Republicans and certainly conservatives and libertarians were saying, hey, there's waste in non-defense spending and there's waste in defense spending too. Let the sequestration begin. Let the spending cuts begin. But the, the most important issue is the debt and the limitation or ceiling or no ceiling. We've got Democratic congressmen saying we shouldn't have any ceiling. There should be no limits which, of course, is the Democrat mantra. No limits at all for anything, spending and debt. But what's going to happen is we're going to see seriously a further discussion of this. And as far as tax increases, hey, on January 1st, every working person that gets a payroll had a major tax increase. And Social with a two Security. And Medicare, yeah. Social Security, Medicare, 2%. And it hurts. And people, people call me. It's really interesting. Why didn't somebody tell us about that? Why didn't they let us know? And now some of the early Obamacare additional taxes are cutting in right now, and people are saying, why didn't somebody tell us? Well, so I've been talking about the fiscal cliff for over a year, and we've been writing blog posts about it for over a year. I guess, well, no one reads what we write, so. Yeah. Um, but the, <laughs> the tax increase on the Social Security, on the uh, payroll tax, that was put, it, it was a tax reduction that was put in place to stimulate the economy during the Great Recession. And it was scheduled to go away. And it was extended once. Mm -hmm. And then it went away on, Janu on January 1st. You know, to call that a, a, a tax increase uh, is a, seems a little. No, but that's exactly the way Republicans think. Because the whole <laughs> idea of the Bush tax cuts were to go away at the end of 2010. It is because it, is because it doesn't pencil out. So anything that doesn't pencil out has to sunset and expire. Bush tax cuts were to sunset and expire. And though Sam talks about the fact that 99% are there, remember the Democrat position was that the taxes would not be raised on the middle class, which was 98%. The difference is now this 400 to 450,000. But there's still a problem politics involved, <laughs> involved in this. And uh, President Obama was running on the idea that you soak the rich. You soak them, but you don't soak the, the, the folks beneath that. But you cannot solve or get anywhere near solving the problem of, of the deficit, the deficits, large deficits and the debt, unless some of the rest of us below 400,000 bucks are paying more money or we're cutting or both. There's only so it can't many be rich. Done. Only can't so be many done. rich and you can tax them 100 percent. And it's not going to And you're talking it. about hours or days of Well, of that's the why Calbert, the I got to I got to go to a guy with a green eye shade here. Uh, uh, Calbert, uh, uh, is there is there all of this uncertainty that we have going uh, on and the, the sequestration, 110, 110 billion bucks, some of which is half of which is going to be in the military, which we, we care about. How do you how do you work that into the, the budget making process? I mean, the, the, the governor had a long list of things he wants to spend money on the other day. And how are you going to do that if if the sequestration comes through? Yeah, well, I'm not a partisan uh, person, but in terms of trying to, to in trying to plan, <laughs> so I, I, I'm actually intrigued by this conversation. But in terms of looking at how we are planning for our state government to prepare for if sequestration were to occur, we're looking at analytics that say sequestration for Hawaii could result at 7.3 percent across the board. Military defense cut spending in Hawaii would equate to about 231 million dollars in reduced federal spending on the military to Hawaii. For your state budget, the state receives about $2 billion uh, worth of federal funding for state programs, and that's not highway funds. These are social service programs, Medicaid, 
$2 billion, it represents close to 20% of the entire state budget, is funded through the federal programs. But of that $2 billion, roughly maybe somewhere between $25 million to $45 million, depending how federal agencies deploy those sequestration cuts, would be directly to state programs. So although it's not a large amount percentage-wise, it's still a significant amount of money that the state would have to find. It's not easy to find 25 to 45 million dollars in the state budget. But we, we're trying to prepare, looking at how much uh, revenues can be set aside to be shifted if that needed to be the case. We're fortunate in Hawaii that revenues have been picking up over the last couple of years, and your state has been uh, constraining on expenses so that there's been positive ending balances over the last couple of years. So those are helping. But how does the state of Hawaii survive into the beyond two years, beyond the next two years budget, uh, looking at reduced federal spending to state programs? That's a real trick. And how do you take those, these things into consideration when you folks on the Council of Revenues are trying to, to, to tell him how much the growth is going to be? Well, so the first thing is that Calvert and I were speaking before the show. I don't think sequestration is going to happen. It was designed not to happen. Republicans it, want it to do designed, it now, as I understand it. They wanted it, to. They, it, it was designed no, to be so onerous and so damaging to all of the programs that it would force Congress to actually do what was right. And earlier you, you, you said, well, we didn't do anything on spending cuts. Well, that's not true. The, between the, the tax revenue increases in the Taxpayer Relief Act and the, the, I think it was Budget Control Act of 2011, we've reduced the deficit over a decade by close to $3 trillion. The deficit as a percent of GDP has been falling for three years now. And I, I would argue that this year we'll probably see the deficit around 5, 5.5% 5 .5 of GDP. Now average is more like 3% over the last 40 years. Because as, we, as uh, Representative Hanabusa was saying, it doesn't pencil out. Our revenue, the, the money that we bring in to the federal government comes in at about 17% of GDP and our spending average is about 20% of GDP. So we've got a 3% PUCA that has been there for the last 40 years on average. And things got worse in the last four or five years because of the Great Recession. Revenues fell, so revenues were down at 14% of GDP and spending went up just like you would expect. But we're already making good progress. We're close to, if you just take the, the kind of numbers we're talking about on the, on the sequestration, like $1 trillion, $1.2 trillion over 10 years, that stabilizes the debt relative to GDP. So no, it's not exploding. It's not this incredible crisis that's facing us. What, the crisis is 15 years down the road. It's health care. That's the problem that has to be. But that doesn't have to be solved today. Right now, the, the crisis is incredibly high unemployment, continued slow growth of the economy, and cutting more than we need to today to stabilize the debt just means you've made the economy worse and you've doomed people to continual unemployment. I'm going back to this question that I started with, I think. I think oh, I started with. I didn't answer with. your question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't. Well, it's, it's quite common yeah, among professors. We <laughs> just, do, we just yeah. go back. <laughs> we don't necessarily answer a question, question or ask a good question. We don't so do how that. Do we, don't do how that do that we that. take into account these? So we take right. numbers when you're talking similar to, to what Calvert is talking about. What I started with, I said sequestration is not going to happen. Okay, so I'm not going to take the worst case scenario and mm -hmm. The very worst case scenario, as so I see you're it, always and gonna, build it into. You're always going to start out with the most opt optimistic. No, one. I didn't say that. Well, Colleen okay. says so. For example, is not we be. so we took so the tax revenues uh, that have been increased. Those, particularly the payroll tax, has been in our forecast for two years now. We were mm -hmm. convinced that the payroll tax was going away at the end of 2012, and so that's already been constraining the forecast that I submit to the council. Okay. The numbers that, that Cobbert was talking about, those numbers are also coming into play in our forecasts. So we're reducing our well, overall well, what, economic growth. And what you forget is that the Budget Control Act, which has sequestration, is only one of the two components. The other component is the caps. So $900 billion is saved by way of caps. So the cuts that you say are not technically cuts necessarily, but we're capping spending at the 2008 levels. And what you see in, at set forth in that bill is how much government is spending. Example of that is what happened in the, the what you call the continuing resolution to March. That is capped 
at that level. This 1.047 trillion, somewhere on their line, is what it is capped at. And that <clears throat> keeps a cap on spending. So it's not correct to say we're not doing anything on spending. And that part of the Budget Control Act is not, people don't really talk about it, but it's there. And the reason it's not going to be talked about is the fact that that's going to stay constant. So you have sequestration, which was supposed to take care of 1.2 trillion, and you have this other component. And that's what resulted with the amount of that particular debt ceiling raise that Obama was entitled to do. Now we have a two month reprieve on sequestration. 12 billion, 12 billion is the cost of that. If you were to really look carefully at what they agreed to, you will see that the Republicans agreed to $12 billion more of revenues, which they don't like to mention, and there's $12 billion in caps. What this is supposed to do is give them now the opportunity to decide how they're going to handle sequestration. The problem with sequestration is the fact that it's across the board. So OMB said it. Defense is going to take a 9.4% cut and social programs, so non -discretion, the discretionary non-defense is going to take at 8.2 percent. But what you also don't understand in the Budget Control Act is there are certain categories of social programs that are exempt. One, for example, Social Security is not going to be touched. Medicaid isn't going to be touched. Medicare has that funny 2 percent, not like you mentioned. It's only 2 percent and it's to a specific group. And veterans is also not touched. So we have a whole list Children's health is not touched. There's a whole list in the law that is exempted. And remember now, for that law to pass, Republicans agreed to that. So that is really what you're looking at. So to say you know, just unilaterally that we didn't do cuts, that's wrong, because the Budget Control Act does take care of that. To say that all these other things haven't been considered is wrong. And I also strongly disagree with my friend here that the Republicans do not want to see sequestration because of the military component. And I sit in those, those hearings with them. Military is very important. They do not want to see that happen. But there is no way you're going to do the sequestration without addressing military see, as well as See, this is why the American public has such a low feeling about Congress. Because they do a lot of talking, but they don't tell the truth. The spending is increasing. The debt is going up. People know, the people that you talk to, people that are working for a living, that they are worse off now than they were two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, and there's nothing being done to stop this. We've got a profligate president, we've got a Democrat Senate, and for Colleen to sit here and talk only about Republicans, come on, look in the mirror. It takes two to tango, you know, and the Democrats know. have gotten us into this situation. Oh, it will no, take no, 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 both no. parties to get us out of it, no, no, no. and to ignore that is absolutely the, the, ridiculous. No, no, no. The reason and you have the, one other no, thing the that reason we didn't you talk have about, the debt is because is Bush the put those Inouye wars factor. off the Inouye off factor. Can we talk budget. about that? Can we talk about that for a moment? You most definitely can, because Thank I think you. this man right here, Calvert, uh, coined that phrase, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> you've, you've said that's a bigger problem than the fiscal cliff would. Uh, well, I've said that the Inouye cliff uh, in reference especially to what Representative Hanabusa has already pointed out, what the impact of overnight uh, a significant change in terms of the funding stream for uh, what Senator Inouye was able to bring to Hawaii for all these years. And, and in saying the Inouye cliff, I, I absolutely do not want to uh, in any way think that it's belittling or only to marginalize the importance of uh, a significant citizen like Senator Inouye down to just pure fiscal uh, aspects, yeah. but it's pretty clear that the ability of Sen what Senator Inouye was able to do to drive and bring uh, funding in, across various diverse streams uh, into our state, uh, that's a significant loss, and it's difficult to quantify because it's so diverse and his ability to do it. So, you know, it's, it's the talents and the abilities of Representative Hanabusa and the rest of the congressional team to fill that void. Um, but I, I think the representative would even admit that it's a tough challenge to fill because it's a very big void. It's difficult to quantify, and that's the problem because some anecdotal uh, amounts that are being sent, uh, said out there is um, as much as 400 to $450 million a year worth of federal contribution either into government contractors, direct federal spending, military contribution uh, across the entire economy uh, is at stake. 
So what that impact will ultimately be over the next couple of years, I think that's what we're really keeping a watch on. And I do believe that it could be more significant than the fiscal cliff. Part of the reason is because, uh, as Dr. Bonham has mentioned, the federal sequestration or fiscal cliff issues may not occur, and I would like to think that they don't, but the Inouye cliff is still mm -hmm. potential reality there. So. That was Panos Provedoras University of Hawaii class that came up with that estimate of up to $450 million. And I mentioned that before Calbert and the governor made their, their economic uh, forecasts and budget estimates earlier this year. And one of the things that I said 10 years ago was this state should be looking at ways of enhancing revenue by improving the business climate instead of depending on one political person, whoever he or she might be. Uh, poor Ed Case, the Democrat, said the same thing six years ago when he first ran against uh, Senator Akaka, and nobody was listening. And even today, we're still looking around, who's going to replace Senator Inouye? Instead of talking about a free market, diversified economy, attracting new capital, encouraging existing business, we're looking for an individual, a political individual, to bring us money from the federal government. And I'm saying it's not going to happen. We better get used to it, and we better change, and we better smarten up. Well, I think that uh, there is no question. Senator's impact is going to be felt. However, I think what people are failing to recognize is the fact that Senator, I believe, recognized that he was not going to be living forever. And I think when you look at things like the pivot to Asia Pacific, which is one of the issues that, you know, when President Obama said it and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said it and then Leon Panetta said it, when you looked at that and you looked at what exactly Senator had been doing over this period of time, you would recognize that what he really did was he positioned Hawaii. Hawaii is the home of the Pacific Command. The Pacific Command has 55% of the Earth's surface, more than 50% of the population, 36 some odd countries. And we all know, as the President said, the 21st century is going to be determined by Asia Pacific. East West Center, for example, all of the Asia Pacific strategy centers and all the different things that have been done. These are, I think, his way of having at least given us us, Hawaii, the opportunity to be the center of the Pacific. We are, of course, the most forward state, and we are the natural place. And when you look at what the, the Department of Defense budget looks like and what it covers, it isn't just military in terms of a classic fighting war machine. It is all the research and development that goes into it. It is all the, really, when you think about energy, I don't think anyone is doing energy innovation in this state like DOD is, and that funding is coming. These are funding that he has set in place. What we need, what we need to be as a state, is have the foresight to recognize what he saw and what he started, and to be able to continue that. That's where I agree with Sam. The leadership of the next, whatever you want to call it, the generation or the next 10 years, is going to determine that for us. But you cannot ignore the fact that we had somebody who was so brilliant and who saw what our future would be. We're in the middle of the Pacific. We're a blip in the Pacific. Yet there is so much that is controlled in this state. And it is going to be dependent upon the state leaders to recognize that, as well as the federal government to continue along the way that it has been. But again, it seems to me that it's an uncertain moment for, for those people who, are, who, have to, who have to deal with a budget now or come up with a budget for, for the next fiscal year. But, because but that's always the case. Oh, it's I mean, always this is the case. No, we went for about it, five years at the beginning, from 20, 2000 to 2005, when we were just rolling in it. Yeah, it was still uncertain. The Council on Revenues missed the forecast for five years. That's because you were so under forecast. Well, you under forecast. That's still uncertain, <laughs> that's right. right? That's still we uncertain, all agree right? On that. Um, <laughs> and I think that the word cliff is a, is a problem, really, for right. both of these yeah, things, fiscal true. cliff yeah. and in a way cliff. Neither one of these are cliffs. No, it's financial right? poly. And, the, and, you know, there are mo some people refer to the fiscal cliff as a fiscal slope. And in some ways, that's the same, the same thing with Senator Inouye's effects. And, and we're all going to have to work harder. Um, and, but not all the money is going to disappear you know, because he's passed. And as, you know, as uh, Representative Hanabuso points out, he worked very, very hard to make sure that these programs were put in place 
And we may very well see increases in, in DOD spending in Hawaii over the next decade, even with cutting in federal mm -hmm. spending. It's, you know, it's completely possible that we'll see more personnel here and more activity with, with what's going on in, in uh, moving people out of Okinawa, et cetera. Exactly. So that's actually very true because actually in early December, the state of Hawaii actually sold about $800 million in general obligation bonds. And we were on the mainland talking with investors and credit agencies. And this was before the passing of Senator Inouye. And on questions related to DOD sequestration, our analytics actually looked at the possibility Hawaii would actually net out positive with sec even with DOD sequestration, largely because we had already had word of redeployments from Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Hawaii would likely benefit from that. You'd also have this Asia Pacific focus with the Pacific Command as troops are pulled out of the Central Command in, in Asia uh, in, with Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So we act up to that point, we actually thought that Hawaii could have a very good chance of netting out positive. We've somewhat tempered that, I'll be honest, I've somewhat tempered it for financial planning purposes because of the passing of Senator Inouye. <clears throat> but I think that's still largely the case that for DOD sequestration side, that $231 million that I mentioned earlier, some of that, if the, even if that were to occur, could be offset by some redeployment issues across the global U.S. military. Uh, but it seems to me that, that uh, if I'm not mistaken this morning, I read that you want to raise the tax on hotel room tax, right? TAT. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to raise it, what, uh, a percent, one? It, two, the, the, two, there is a proposal two. out there of the governor to, uh, that would keep the, the there's currently a 2% on the TAT that is temporary, set to sunset June 30th, 2015. That was put into place by the legislature uh, several years back, but it is set to sunset regardless. But the governor's proposal would like to maintain the current status quo, that temporary 2%, keep it permanent, but then on top of that, add another uh, two percent, but that's really a discussion going forward into the future years about this discussion. Where are state revenues going to go? Because some of the dis the items that we've discussed this evening, the future outside of the next two years for the state, there is looking to be a decline or at least a leveling of revenues that could portend a slowing of future growth in state government. The governor's the governor's budget right now for the next two fiscal years forecasts 8.8 percent in spending the first year, 11 percent more the second year. We do not have the economic growth or diversification to support that. The governor has come up with an increase in transit and accommodation tax, TAT. He's come up with an increase in conveyance tax. His fellow uh, union members that brung him to the dance, many of whom are now unhappy with him, they want an increase in the general excise tax, notably the teachers and all that. There are new spending programs like the pre-education program. I don't know where all of this money is going to come from unless there are additional taxes. We're already the third highest tax state in the nation, and we're talking about taxing the middle class because we're the only ones that have the money. There's very few rich, and it's, it's the same thing. So if you're talking about you know, the federal impact, we're concerned about what's happening here in Hawaii, and in Hawaii we have several choices, and one of them is to cut back on, on spending and debt. And, and as good as that bond sale was, and I, I always say uh, that Calbert Young is the best uh, Abercrombie appointee. It probably hurts him more for me to, to support him. He's an honest guy and he doesn't spin. But even when he's talking about these massive general obligation bond sales at lower rates, it's still debt. It's more debt. And we are heading right in the same direction as California and Greece, period. Of course, California is uh, apparently readjusted itself somewhat. Well, well, the diff well, first of all, to be clear, the governor's budget that's submitted for the next biennium is balanced without the need for additional revenues. None of the tax increase discussion is relevant for the next biennium. All of the proposals are based on even what the Council on Revenue is projecting. For the next two years, revenue growth still looks strong, but it's after the next two years, mm -hmm. revenues are going to flatten out. In fact, they will dip. That's when the, that is the point in time when the state needs to start preparing now looking for what the revenue streams are going to be three years from today. So that's where all of this discussion about tax increases, it's relevant now, but it's actually needed three years from now. And the big difference between Hawaii and California on selling debt, because I totally agree with Senator Sloan, I'm very loath on debt, but the difference, there's good debt and there's bad debt. <laughs> the difference between for Hawaii is all of our general obligation bond debt is for capital improvement infrastructure. California sells debt to pay for operational expenses on a yearly basis. That is bad debt. 
So where we see where Hawaii is, yes, it is more, it is more debt where we have now, but what the governor is trying to impress is that we are taking this opportunity with, with the credit markets being where they are to invest in towards future for infrastructure development in Hawaii. Representative Hanabusa, Don and Kunia wants to know, I'm a federal employee, got an email today saying we may be forced to do 22 furlough, day, furlough days one day per week. What are you gonna to do to prevent this? That is, what he's talking about there is the fact that they've, the federal government, and I, he must be a, uh, a DOD employee, they're saying that if, if the, the tier, tier B of the sequestration uh, doesn't take place, I mean, takes place, then that would be the long-term impact on Hawaii. That's the projection if it were to take place. But that is, and believe it or not, of, of the charts that they produce, that is the only impact for Hawaii. I do not believe we're going to get there. That's not even tier one. That's tier two. So I think he should um, hang tight because I don't think it's going to happen. Not, 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 not going to happen. Uh, Kimo says, uh, what is the state doing to keep us financially whole? I can see no revenue stream other than tourism that the state supports. The only thing that they talk about is raising state taxes and taxing our small pensions. You talk about coming up with a more diversified and more vital uh, yeah. private sector. Uh, could you be more specific? Sure. Look, we have everything going for us in this state in terms of a politically stable economy, part of the United States and all that. Yet capital overflies Hawaii, westbound capital, eastbound capital. Why? Because we have a lousy business climate. Because even what we're seeing right now with the discussion of TAT, the only thing that's kept this economy going for the last two and a half years has been the visitor industry. So we have lawmakers that say, oh, you're doing so well now, let's tax you more, let's make sure we cripple you. We always talk about Hawaii having the three-legged stool. Construction, they're all sitting on the bench. Defense, yeah, and non-defense, yeah, but that's in, in doubt right now. Visitor industry, and as you know, all of us know, uh, visitor industry, you can be at the top today, you can have a disease or you can have something else that happens tomorrow, and, and you're really sucking wind for it. We need to diversify and tell people We've got a healthy and vibrant business climate. We want you to do business. We don't want to tax you and regulate you and prohibit you, which is what Hawaii is noted for. That's why people don't come here. That's why local businesses, even though they need employees, are not hiring. They're not doing the things that they would like to do but cannot afford to. We start looking at fees and things like that. It's terrible. And we haven't even talked about unfunded liability where we are the worst in the nation with the employee's retirement system and the EUTF, which the taxpayers are on the hook for. This guy here has been very honest about that. We've talked about it. I give the administration credit. They want to pay down those unfunded liabilities, but they're tremendous. We're talking $25, $30 billion, but it's not going to happen because you've got people in the legislature, whenever they see more money, they either want to take it for more social welfare programs or the unions, uh, 900 strong were out there circling the capital today. We want more money. So anytime Mr. Bonham or Mr. Young talk about things are getting better, the unions say, well, if they're getting better, we want more of it. That's not a business climate. I, had a, I had a, got a letter from a guy. I should have brought it. Uh, he's an octogenarian like me, and he uh, uh, wrote, me, wrote me a letter telling me that you should be the next Secretary of Labor, that this lady's leaving. Are you, are you <laughs> trying to become the United States Secretary of Labor? No. Obama needs some women there. Not me. <laughs> Not you? Yeah, Not me. You, don't, you, don't, you don't want the job. Well, I just thought I'd throw it out to be there. US <laughs> this, It's interesting to, to talk about the, the diversifying the economy, because if you, if you look at where we are now relative to, say, where we were 20 years ago, the economy is much more diverse. You know, we, we think about tourism as, as you know, it, it, it's still one of those primary legs, obviously, but in, in real spending, we have lower real spending from tourists in Hawaii now than we did in 1990. But the rest of the economy is much bigger, if you take which means that we are much more diversified. And we yeah. did that, okay, with no government programs at all. I mean, I there were lots Carl. of programs to try and do that. We spent a billion dollars on high-tech tax credits. Right. We, right. we gave away a billion dollars, and, and, and now we're... very little result. 
Um, yeah, that would be my take on it. Well, you're talking about and, three percent of, of the alternative energy and generators. We're, you know, and we're giving away, we're, we're continuing to give away money and tax credits. Now it's the it's the PV tax credit. And I agree. When the, when the revenues come in strong, yeah, we spend it. Everybody's we in We spend line. it really fast. And I was, actually, I was talking to Cobbett a couple of weeks ago about a crazy idea I had that when the Council on Revenues can't forecast the revenues fast enough, which I think is what's going to happen in the next two or three years, use some of it to pay down the unfunded liabilities. Right. We have a situation in Hawaii much like the U.S. Health care is the problem, right? Our obligations for health care are the problem. That's the... I, I wanted to say one more thing about the visitor expenditures and all, because I mentioned this in my legislative opening remarks, and, and people were amazed. We had record visitor arrivals, 8 million people in 2012. We had record visitor expenditures, $14 billion. But if you look at them in real terms, we were, it was 1980s. It was the Late same 80s. level as 1980s. Yeah. And so people, again, I, I get back to my original point, people don't know economics, they don't know financial things, they're not going to get it from the media, and they're not going to get it from most politicians. We don't talk honestly about what it means. You can't spend more than you're taking in. You can't spend at a rate faster than you're growing in an economy or personal income, and yet that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Tim and Hilo, uh, what has Representative Hanabusa, you, done about the $1 billion owed to the ha Hawaii from the federal government for the Compact of Micronesian Association reimbursement? since you were last on Insights. What have you done? I'm the one who put in the bill that said that the, there's, there's two components. The COFA, of course, is, is the Compact of Free Association. There are three compacts that we have out there. The amount that the all, all states plus Guam and everyone else shares is about $30 million. I have put in a bill to say you reimburse all the states what it is. The GAO report, which was recommended, and they came back with an estimate of $164 million a year is the COFA impact. Hawaii is a good portion of that. Bulk, however, still goes to Guam. I can't get the bill out of my Republican colleague. And the, the reason why is because they're under the impression that the COFA immigrants are like illegal immigrants, and they're not. As you know, that's a function of the fact that we did the bombing, <laughs> and the United States, it's not Hawaii's obligation, neither is it Guam's, and neither is it, is it Arkansas's who's getting a huge percentage. It is the federal government's obligation. The way we would do it is to do that. The other part, the billion dollars, is an estimate of how much Hawaii alone is owed. And we have something in there to say, hey, how about reimbursing us? But let's start first with making sure the state is being made whole now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There she goes again, the Republicans. I remind everybody that we've had solid Democrat congressional delegations. We've had Democrat the presidents. Was, what did I do? The federal and I'm telling government you what has I an did. unfunded mandate for COFA. They My did. figures are that the state of Hawaii spends over $130 million per year on COFA programs, free medical, free welfare, and all of that. The federal government does reimburse a portion, 10 to 11. That's right. Yeah, 10 That's to 11 million I said bucks 30 a year. million but is what we share. But with all these great Democrats that are in, the, in control and in the lead, and to blame it on the Republicans for not getting the money back, doesn't wise, the Congresswoman. Question, the question was, what have I done? Yes. And I said what I did. You and my problem the bill. is. And my problem, and I've gone to go see the Republican chair of the yeah. subcommittee and asked him, please hear this bill. I've got all the insular territories with me saying, please hear the bill. He won't hear the bill. That's my response. What have I done and what is the result? Do you End of case. How the <laughs> politicians tend to raise their voices uh, a little bit. That's, that's because what, I've been with Sam so long. That's we're so passionate. passionate. That's why that's right. they get ahead and yeah. the rest of us just you know, serve yeah. them. I, I, no, I, no, no, I, I don't know. No, no, no. We are your uh, servants. We, I never forget that. What is what, uh, what is the Micronesian uh, COFA um, requirements uh, done to our impact on our economy? Uh, well, I know two years ago when uh, Governor Abercrombie got in, this was this was an issue that was very top of mind, very relevant, uh, and working with the congressional mm -hmm. offices, uh, we did estimate that you know we we tried to get at least thirteen million dollars. Um, a year to help reimburse some of the COFA expense. But if the COFA expense total across our entire uh, social entitlement program in the state is in excess of $100 million, I would not be surprised. 
A hundred, a hundred million. A hundred million dollars. Actually, I would not be surprised. Let, let me mention one other statistic for for your viewers, and that's something else that I predicted several years ago, and it took place last year, 2012, and that is in the state of Hawaii, expenditures for human resource welfare subsidies has now supplanted education as the number one government expenditure in this state. We are paying more for welfare and subsidies than we are for education. And, part and of it's the, gonna grow. The part of the problem worse. also with COFA is the fact that at one point in time, they qualified for Medicaid, and yeah. they don't anymore. And that was, a, that was a change, I think, in the law when Governor Abercrombie was in Congress. Because remember, he was in Congress for 20 years. But the, that's also part of it, is that the Medicaid got somehow, they were not qualified for Medicaid. So now that's why the amount seems to be so huge, because the whole impact is on the, the COFA issue. Mm -hmm. What tax credits have been extended uh, uh, it, it are proposed by the governor? And what, what, are any of them going to be, going to be cut or stopped? Oh, well, there's an, there was a number of actual, um, no tax credits per se, but there was a number of exemptions from various uh, taxes that were temporarily suspended, so it's kind of the reverse of the tax credit. Those will sunset uh, at the end of this fiscal year. So it's the, if you recall back two years, there was a suspension of the GE tax right. exemption to mm -hmm. certain businesses mm -hmm. that was temporarily sunsetted uh, or suspended for two years. That set the sunset. There's no real discussion that I've seen uh, in the legislature to extend uh, that, so th those could come back. Um, but we are talking right now really about the big tax credit out there, or at least get one getting most discussion is the photovoltaic, the alternative energy tax credit. Uh, David on the Big Island wants to know, why will Hawaii state revenue decrease in two years? I think you said that. It, it has to do with a lot of these, uh, ex sunsets. a lot of these sunsets of uh, suspensions of exemptions from tax revenue. So, so you're gonna have a lot of these exemptions coming back into play in that two year period such as the sunsetting of the temporary 2% increase on the transit accommodations tax, that is set to sunset in 2015 if nothing is done. And so that, and so it's, remember, it's not, revenues aren't going down, <laughs> right? So it's, we're talking about going from, you know, six, 7% growth rates down to very low growth rates because two things are happening. One, you've wait, gone wait, through growth, this- Growth in revenue. Yes, rev so revenue is continuing to grow in the forecast. What's happening is the growth rate is getting much smaller because of the sunsetting of some of the tax increases that were put in place during the Great Recession uh, to try and balance the budget when we were bleeding red ink. And the other thing that's happening is that the economy is growing fairly rapidly right now, or it's expected to grow more rapidly in 2013 and 2014 and then begin to slow down in 2015, 2016. People need to remember that there's a, there is a distinction between tax, state tax revenues that fund your state government and the economy. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. So the Council on Revenues is projecting in pretty robust growth for the next two fiscal years in terms of tax revenue. And I think that mirrors very strong economic performance. But it's in 2016 that tax revenue growth is projected to go to about 1% for the state. So that means that in that year, if nothing changes and the predictions come true as, towards, as the council sees it, you're gonna see your state government have a significant drop in terms of this trajectory of tax revenues. That's the year that I'm, asked, I'm saying we need to prepare for. Either cut spending to plan for that, that drop or look at ways to enhance revenues to keep the, the overall growth continuing. Far be it for me to be cynical. No, 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 you but, would never do that. You <laughs> never do that, Sam. But, but in the past where we've had particularly taxes or, or fees that were set to sunset, guess what? When it came time to sunset, people said, we don't have money. Oh, we can't sunset it. And those GET exemptions that, that Calbert is talking about, that brought in $400 million to the budget. And so if they're looking now beyond and saying, oh, we're not going to have money, maybe we shouldn't let that go. As far as the tax credits for solar, uh, the governor actually uh, uh, oversaw the, the rules changes from the state tax department. And there were abuses. Absolutely, there were abuses. And this is a problem with tax credits. You, you don't have the data to show how many jobs were created and what's the benefit. I, I go along with the Lowell Kalapa method, and he says no tax credits, reduce tax rates. Reduce taxes for everybody. Don't pick winners and losers. 
Well, and the Tax Review Commission says that year after, I mean, every time you have a Tax Review Commission, yeah. one of the suggestions is limit the use of tax credits. But they also want to raise the taxes, too. So, we, so uh, one other thing about 20, that's this year's Tax Review Commission. Uh, one other thing about 2016 <laughs> is that the uncertainty around that forecast, you know, you, you've got to add plus or minus two or three percent in 2016, right? Yeah. I mean, it's... And I would hope that would be the case. I hope that, that that's what actualized. For, what, what, for the state, for, you know, as, as their state's budget and finance director, I, I, maybe I come off being more pessimistic, but um, you know, I have to rely on what the council uh, puts in writing and, and, and their forecasting. And, I, and they've been, sometimes, they, a lot of times they miss, but they're pretty good. I mean, they're, they've got people on that, on that council that are far more intelligent uh, at predicting than I am. So I rely very heavily on them. So, and even with federal sequestration, it may never happen, but w you want to plan for the worst case financially and be satisfied that it never happens. So that's where we are in terms of state. So, and, But how, how so, uh, can an economy, whether the state or the federal uh, economy, uh, can it continue to, to grow or come out of this recession when in Washington, and in state houses around the country, too. I, I don't care whether we're talking about Republican blame or Democratic blame, but there is so much uncertainty. Businessmen say that's not a good idea. People who want to start businesses say uncertainty is a bad thing. Uh, that, that people are unlikely to give loans. Is that is that good for us? I mean, no. what what we're doing? And that's and that's the problem with when we do a continuing resolution, or anything like that, or even with a defense budget. The, the problem becomes the uncertainty. More than anything else, people will say to us all the time, just tell us what it is. Yeah. And the main reason why is when you look, you know, I, I call it the uh, deferral method. That the problem is that if you, we do a continuing resolution which takes the 2012 budget to March. The problem is for those kinds of, for example, procurement or whatever else that may be out there, you're not going to do the procurement because you don't know mm -hmm. if it's a cut after mm -hmm. um, after March, whether yeah. that's going to come from your base budget and what are you going to be able to cut. So instead, people tend not to do it, and it's that uncertainty. So and, and you know the defense budget, the defense industry hasn't been really that honest as well. When I talk about them, I'm talking about the the DoD itself, the Department of Defense. From last year, they come in and we I've asked them. What have you done in preparation of sequestration? What have you done? And you know what? They've done nothing. And I asked them, how can you do that? I mean, everybody comes before us, they tell us they want certainty. How can you do that? And their response is, we have been told not to plan for sequestration mm -hmm. because they didn't think it would happen. But it would seem to be that, excuse me. So there's, there's good research that shows that this uncertainty does it's, slow down the economy. It's the worst thing now, we've it. gotten rid of a fair amount of it. I mean, we've gotten rid of the uncertainty over the tax side, the revenue side of the fiscal cliff. Okay, we kicked the can on sequestration, right? We kicked the can on the debt ceiling. Okay, so that's still out there. We got rid of a tremendous amount of uncertainty over healthcare, not about long term, but about the the Obamacare, right? That with the election and with the, the constitutional decision. So uh, we're actually. I mean, a lot of things are going much better than they were a year or two ago. There's the, the uncertainty about Europe has diminished pretty significantly. The, the, the U.S. economy is actually poised to grow. We've got state and local governments aren't cutting anymore. Right? You've, you've even got revenue growth in California. Their budget is actually looking rosier. You've got housing starts are on the way up. Um, all of those things are coming into I mean, Housing hasn't added to the U.S. economy in like four years, but it is now. We have to get past the sequestration and past this next round of planning for budget deficit reduction, and the U.S. economy will expand very nicely. I wouldn't pay a lot, too much attention to him because I think he's way too optimistic. I'm 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 a bit of a pessimist. Listen, this, this, is, uh, this is when you will be way too pessimistic. The, the legislature, by law, <laughs> must right. listen to the I Council of Revenues and, and must pattern its its budget. Uh, you know, after them. As a small business person in Hawaii, as bad as I think it is, long term I'm bullish on Hawaii and I do know that we can make changes and we can do things. But I want to tell you 
that so many of my colleagues have never met a private payroll in their lives and they don't know about the uncertainty and they don't they don't have the luxury of having a continuing you know resolution or having a, a blue ribbon panel or having a commission that meets you know for every two years they've got to make decisions now based on the information they have we've got just a minute left 30 seconds are you bullish I'm, I'm actually also optimistic about Hawaii and the prospects. There, there does need to be some changes, and for your state government to survive 10 plus years, you need to make some changes now. Changes that should have been made 10 years ago, but there's no, there's no better time than the present. In that cauldron of pushing things down the road and de deadlines missed and so forth, are you bullish on the of economy? Of course, especially for Hawaii. We are going to be the center of the pivot to Asia Pacific. This is where it's going to happen. We just need to have the leaders in place who recognize that and are able to ensure that that's where we go. I'm very bullish on Hawaii. Well, okay. We're going to have a little bull doll here oh, from now on whenever we have an economic. <laughs> Carl, Sam, Sam, thank you all very, very much for coming. Greatly appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Move very, very fast. Very, very fast. I didn't have to work very hard. Join us next week on Insights as we explore the legislature's efforts to find ways to energize a sluggish economy. Is the winning solution a casino in Waikiki or on ships, horse betting or a state lottery? Join us for the ongoing debate about legalized gambling. That's next time on Insights. I'm Dan Boylan. Ahoy ho.